All right, well, uh, hello, welcome. This is Level Up Your Scientific Coding. Uh, this is level three, object-oriented programming. Uh, so this webinar is brought to you by CSDMS, the Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System. I'm Mark Piper. I'm coming to you from Piper Space. Uh, I'm a research software engineer at CSDMS. And I'm Benjamin Kempfort, and I work as a postdoc at CSDMS. All right, so what we hope to do today is to show you through argument and through example that you, as a busy geoscientist, should be interested in learning more about object-oriented programming and how it can help improve your workflow and make your life easier. That's right, Mark, and let's be there. It will take some time to get familiar with object-oriented programming. But once you get it, you will save a lot of time. Totally, I agree. It took me a while myself. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So the schedule for today is we will give you a very short overview of what object-oriented programming is. We will give you the perspectives of a grad student, a postdoc researcher, and a professor. We will point you to a couple of resources we think might be interesting for you to learn even more about object-oriented programming. And as with all the previous webinars, we will give you an example of um, an object-oriented program. And that one will be a bit more extensive than the ones we've done in the past. Mark, what can you tell us about object-oriented okay, programming? Okay, well, so what is object-oriented programming? Um, you know, if you do a Google search, you'll come up with dozens of links, you know, explaining object-oriented programming. So, I want to try to give a take that is maybe very high level, and I'm trying to avoid a lot of the details of different languages. So basically, object-oriented programming is a technique for modeling a programming problem. So just as we as geoscientists model physical processes, we can also model a programming problem. So instead of writing, for example, a series of commands in a script, or maybe even using functions, for example, in a script. In object-oriented programming, we start instead with a class. So the idea of a class is that it's a program and it provides structure. It has data that it can use and it has behaviors, things that could, you can do to act upon the data. So when you want to use a class, you create an instance of it. This is called an object. A program then is a single object or a group of objects communicating with each other. All right, so this is kind of a high level example or high level description of what object programming, programming is. Uh, we'll go into a little more detail. Benjamin's gonna give a little bit more as he goes through his example later in the webinar. So I've introduced two concepts, that of class and that of object. I've also introduced two uh, terms, uh, data and behaviors. Now, I'm being really generic there. Each language seems to have its own term for these. Uh, in Python, which we'll use today, uh, we have attributes, those are the data, and methods, those are the behaviors of a class. So just for a simple analogy, you can think of a bike as a class. You know, so bikes have wheels, they have brakes, they have handlebars that you can use to steer them. All right, so these are attributes of a bike. Bikes also have behaviors. You can move on a bike, you can steer a bike, you can brake a bike. All right, so those are behaviors of a bike. All right, so these things could be thought of as a class. Now, an object would be, for example, my 1996 Specialized Stump Jumper FS, all right? So this is an instance of the class. It has all the things that a class has. It has brakes, it has rim brakes, for example. It's a little old. You know, it has wheels, it has a flat bar, you know, and I can do the same things. I can move, I can steer, I can brake on my bike. So that's the difference between a class and an object. Right. Just a couple things before I leave and go, go, go on to Benjamin. Um, so there's a lot we could talk about. You know, I'm, we're just trying to distill 
as much as we can about object oriented programming at a high level into this webinar. Uh, also, object oriented programming isn't necessarily better than any other style of programming. However, it does tend to lead to better outcomes. I think that the thought that you put into writing classes helps in the long run. Uh, but that said, writing good classes is also a learned skill. I know that over the years I've written many really bad classes. I've gotten better over time. Okay, so that's a, a really high level overview of what object-oriented programming is. Benjamin, you're up. So let's talk um, about the perspectives. And, you know, as a graduate student, you might think like object-oriented programming is, is maybe a bit too complex for me, but like soon you will discover you will have big piles of data, you will have several scripts. And if you're working on a complex problem, we are convinced actually object-oriented programming is something you should invest in. And the same is true for postdocs. And what I find especially interesting here is that object-oriented programming allows you to collaborate with different people. And while you're working on your own class and your own methods, and doing the behavior you want to have in your class, you can distribute tasks and ask other people you're collaborating with to develop their own classes and to bring everything together afterwards. So that's very neat. All right, oh, so research scientist. Benjamin, you snuck up on me, sorry. All right, so uh, from the perspective of a research scientist, this is kind of where I am right now. So object-oriented programming can make, uh, we found this in our work at CSDMS. We use a lot of object-oriented code um, as we develop our cyber infrastructure at CSDMS. Uh, secondly, it's also easier for others maybe to jump in and collaborate with you and contribute to things that you're creating. Uh, I know that I've had experience with this. I've been working with other people who write object-oriented code, and I find it a little bit easier to find out to little places where I can get in and help work with the code. All right, so these are perspectives from a research scientist. Next, from a professor. And this is uh, from the idea of a professor, not necessarily a teaching professor, but more as a professor as the leader of a group of students and postdocs. So, object oriented programming could help you as a professor. For example, you can train your students and postdocs to write object oriented code, which again may help them be more productive. You can encourage this. Um, it's also easier to manage your group and direct software projects you know, if you're using object oriented code. So there are many reasons. These are a couple of reasons that we came up with. Okay, uh, next then. So these are the whys. We've given examples or at least arguments for why you as a grad student, postdoc, research scientist, or professor would like to use object oriented programming. Next is the where. So uh, I want, we, you know, in each of our webinars, we wanted to try to, you know, scrape the internet and try to find useful online resources for the topics that we're just covering. So I want to do this for object oriented programming. And you know, if you do a Google search on object oriented programming, you know, there's, again, there's dozens of links. I wasn't super happy with a lot of them, but these are the ones I, ha I found, and I think I can argue for why they are useful. So first of all, the Java tutorials. You know, so Java is still the language that's used most often, I believe, in computer science courses in order to teach programming and especially object oriented programming. And the, the tutorials are still good. I know that I went through them when I was learning object oriented programming many years ago. So I, still, I think they're still useful. Say for me, Mark. Yeah, cool, all right. So next, uh, Wikipedia. And again, I feel a little embarrassed about listing Wikipedia, the Wikipedia entry for object oriented programming as a reference. But I did so because Wikipedia, you know, kind of uses the wisdom of the crowds approach because it's made by many people. And so it kind of, smooths out many of the language specific pieces of information about object oriented programming and gives kind of a good high level overview of what it is. Plus, you know, Wikipedia always has really good links at the bottom of the page and you can explore those links to get more information. 
So I'm not too embarrassed. I think it's a good thing. It's a good resource. It's fine. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, next is a, a, a medium post, actually. Uh, this is by a guy who's kind of known in software development circles. Uh, the tone is a little bit arrogant. Uh, that was a little bit off-putting. But if you can get past that, I think that his little essay on a simple explanation of object-oriented programming is pretty cool. I think I learned something from it. I, I like the way it was explained. Uh, and finally, a YouTube video. So this last one, um, uh, I enjoyed this. It was, a, it was a clever, cute description of object-oriented programming. Uh, and it's only seven minutes long. So, you know, if you don't like it, it's only seven minutes that, that are gone from your life. But I enjoyed it. I recommend it. Shall, shall we play that right now, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> it's seven minutes. I, don't know. I, I, I worry that we're pressed for time. That can be a good add-on for people after the webinar. Okay, so that's it for uh, some resources. Next is Benjamin. Yeah, so let's try to look um, to an example here of object-oriented programming. And I'm going to switch slides here. So before we dive into it, let's look at this piece of Python code having five lines. And let's try to break it down in some core components. And as Mark said, like any program, any code you're writing, you have data components and you have actions going on. And in this case, you have the value of four um, being assigned to X. You have 124, which are used for comparison. And then you have a number of characters saying, hello world. Now, you might wonder why I didn't color the plus one in red uh, as a data component. And the reason why is because plus one is actually incrementing something. It's an action going on. So you see the red values and characters indicating data. And in the same time, you have actions going on on every line. You have an assignment, you have a loop, an increment, a conditional test, and in the end, you print something out. So try to keep that in mind while we run through the example. And it's important to realize that this data and action structures are actually present in any programming technique you're familiar to. So it all starts at a very low uh, end, at the low level of abstractions, where you will just enter values in your command line. And that's all fine, but at one point you want to store those values in variables, and you want to organize your codes in a script so that you can um, do slightly more complex things. And then at one point, everything is, is getting messy if you're just scripting out every line of code because you want to reuse certain lines. So you want to use functions to go to a higher level of sophistication. And for your data, you want to organize or group your information in data structures like lists or dictionaries, et cetera, et cetera. Now, with these increasing um, sophistication methods, the, the, the increase in sophistication, you can also tackle uh, more complex problems. But at one point, you will see that actually the structures which are there are not sufficient to, to tackle really complex problems. Um, and that's where we want to talk about today. So we're going to introduce object-oriented programming here as a way to structure your code even better and make it more robust in general. So last week, I was thinking of a good example to, to to show you guys how we could do object-oriented programming. And at one point, I was realizing we're actually held by the situation where most of you are sitting at home, like we are. Um, and that's, of course, because of this coronavirus going on, and Mark too, obviously. So, and I came across this very nice article in the Washington Post, which is uh, explaining why outbreaks like coronavirus spread exponentially. And more importantly, what governments can do to actually flatten the curve. So, and they came up with a couple of very neat graphics showing um, the society where the dots you see in the square are representing people, red dots are representing infected people, and green dots are representing healthy people. And throughout the simulation, you see how through interactions between the dots, your society is getting infected. And more importantly, they also evaluated what the impact of social isolation um, was or social distancing in general and implementing a lockdown. And I thought, well, this, this is a great example to show you guys object-oriented programming. And what I didn't do was writing a program from scratch. So I just Googled, like Mark did, and I came across this very neat program of PhD Paul van Gent, 
is working in the Netherlands in the University of Delft, and he actually translated um, the simulations of the Washington Post in, in a sequence of Python um, functions and, and, and methods using even more realistic values to simulate the spread of the coronavirus. And um, using his code, you can create simulations. And I will, I will share with you the code on our GitHub folder, Levela, um, at the end of the webinar. So what you can do is, for example, simulate a baseline simulation where you have 2,000 people sitting in a square. They will interact. And in this simulation, you don't have any measure. So there's no lockdown. There's no social isolation. And what you see is um, that infection rate is bumping up quite quick. Everyone is getting infected. And the healthcare capacity, which is this straight red line in the bottom, is easily exceeded. So that's not good. Um, so let's try to come up with a solution here. So um, I took the code of Paul Van Gen, but I restructured it a bit so that it's more reflecting this object-oriented programming behavior. Um, and by the end of the webinar, I will, I will give you the code, and it's up to you to play with lockdown and social isolation to see how things work up. Um, but before we do so, let's think of this problem. So we have coronavirus, and we want to make a program out of it. That's the goal. So you start by creating a domain. OK, that's easy. And then the first thing you want to do is you want to populate your domain. So that means that you need a variable saying what your population size would be. So you need variable population size. The second thing is you want to know who is sick, the red dots, and who is healthy. So you need to know the health status of your people in the domain. That's the second variable. Then, as you know, people um, are contagious if they are infected. And uh, to know the range in which people are contagious, so how close you can get to someone who is infected, you need to come up with a variable saying, the range or um, the radius of this infection bubble. So we need yet another variable, which is infection range. And then obviously it's not only a range, but once you're in the range, you have a certain chance of being infected because not everyone who is coming closer to the infected person will actually be infected. So that's still something else you have to consider, an infection chance. People are also moving around, so you want to give them a vector, a velocity, or at least a mean speed, yet another variable, a mean speed. And then, unfortunately, if you're infected, and that's a problem with this coronavirus, um, you can also die from it. So you want to know what the mortality is of your virus, yet another variable. Luckily, most people recover, but that takes a while, so you have to define a variable saying what the um, recovery period is. So there you go, another variable, recovery duration. And then things are getting even more complex because if you simulate a society, people who are elder, the elderly, are more susceptible um, of dying from coronavirus. So you want to stratify your population and you can do that by at least giving a mean age of your population. So there you go, yet another variable. That's a lot of variables, Benjamin. How are you gonna organize all these? Exactly, Mark, that's, that's the question. Because, <laughs> you know, you have this virus going on, you have your population, that's already a couple of variables, but then there's also like our society. You can do something as society, you can go in lockdown. So, I would say that that's another, yet another variable you have to take into account and an action associated with it. So we end up with several variables and we have to structure them in one way or another. Because for the entire program, these are all of them. So um, you see that it's, it's, it's getting like very, very busy out there. Um, and with all these variables, you have actions going on. For example, for the population size, um, you want to create a population, obviously or let's pick another one, you have the mean age of your population and you want to create a stratified population with that following a Gaussian distribution or anything else. So that's a lot of variables and functions associated to those variables. And the problem is actually that some of these functions or actions are infecting variables at the same time. So you can have 
infection and you can have um, speed of your population. So your population will move and be infected in the same time. And how are you going to structure all of that? That's a lot of information going on. Um, luckily, we can try to group the information we see here in different, what I call now groupings. So if you take a closer look, what you see is that you can actually divide these variables into variables which are associated with our virus, with our population, and with our society. So for virus, that's range, chance, duration, and rate, for example. And it's even better because in these groups, you can also connect the actions which are acting on the variables which we classified in the group. So for example, infect is something which is associated to the virus. Um, or activate lockdown is something which is associated to the society. And what we did is not just structuring your code in groupings. What I actually did here was what Mark already referred to in the beginning. I was creating classes. So what I did is actually coming up with three classes, a piece of data, properties or attributes, depending on the language you're working in, and associated functions, methods in um, object-oriented programming terminology. I like how you're modeling a, a, a programming problem that is actually a model. Yeah, exactly. Model. model. Um, so today we want to talk about object-oriented programming. We have our class, and in the class we have data and actions feeding in it. Again, like in any programming technique, um, but for classes we will refer to data as uh, properties or attributes and uh, functions will be referred to as methods. And in this case, virus would be our class. I'm going to illustrate in a second and you can make instances of this class. For example, you have the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is then an object or an instance of our class virus. And then we have Ebola, which is another dangerous virus, which could also be an object of our class virus. So um, I will try to to show how you can build a, a class from, from scratch with you guys. So, and what we will do is we will define a class virus. We will give it uh, three properties, name, infection, range, and, and infection chance. And we will um, define two methods. So, and we will create two objects or instances of this virus class. So let's go ahead. Now I'm switching screens. That's always a bit tricky. Okay. There we go. So I already set up a notebook for you and I will make this available on the GitHub after the webinar, obviously. So let's start by creating a class. And you can just do that by writing class and then the name of your class. And Benjamin, can you bump up the font size a little bit on that? Oh yeah, sure. Better Mark? Yeah, cool. Thanks. My eyes are getting old, you know. No, no. Good that you say so. So we created our class and the first thing we will do is implement this method document self. So we will say, okay, let's create a method and to de define a method in a class, you just use the terminology you would use otherwise uh, for creating a function. So you say def document self parentheses column and we will do something in this method. So what we will do is we will document. So we will just say, print out the name. So let's say the name of the virus is apps. And then we will add self, and I will come back to that, self.name. Now this keyword self is critical here. So for every method you will define in a clause, you will actually operate your method on an object. So for every class, you can create multiple objects like Mike, his bike, Mark, his bike. So he had, I think it's a mountain bike, Mark, your, your yeah. jumper. So you could yeah. have also a race bike from the same class. So right. you, have, you, have to feed, you have to feed the information of the object to the class. So that's why in any function or method in a class, you have to define the object you're working on. So by definition, Every method, and that's really important, whatever you do, every method or function in Python in a class will start with the object, a pointer to the object, if you want. Okay? So we have 
print the name of the virus is. And now well, we will print one more thing. We will print um, the, oh, the infection chance is self dot infection chats. I will make it a bit smaller, Mark. Yeah, it's okay. You can put it on there. Can you still read this? Yeah, I can. Well, oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay, and I, I run the cell as is. So I created a clause, and now you might wonder where are the properties of this clause? And that's a good question, and we will worry about them later. So what we will do first is. Um, let's try to make an object of the virus clause. So um, I said we have virus one, virus one, and this is where we are going to create properties, virus one dot name. And we will say virus one dot name equals silly name virus one. And in our slides, we also asked to give the infection rates and infection chance. So we will make other properties, virus one dot infection range is we will give it a random number and virus one infection chance equals let's say one percent so these are properties but for now we have still not created an object of this virus clause so obviously before we start defining properties we should actually create objects of the class virus. We, we should like let Python know that we actually want to make an object of the virus class. So we should start with saying v1 equals virus. So that's how you create an instance of the class virus. And you should also add parentheses. For now, you can just like um, enter nothing. And let's see uh, if this is going to work. So we run the cell and the cell runs. So we have a couple of properties. We created a virus object. Now let's see if we can actually call that method we defined. Can we document what's in the virus? So let's see. So we will say v1 dot document self parentheses and we will run the code. So, oh yeah, that's something I should have adjusted. So I'm trying to print out a floating number here. So I should convert it to a string. I will rerun the block, all right. And the output of our uh, function or method of the class is as we expected. So we will print out the name and we will print out the infection chance. So far, so good. So let's now make the second uh, object of the same class as we asked in our slides. So let's make a second object, v2 equals virus. This is where we're going to create um, the object. V2 name is SARS COVID 2. Um, we will increase the infection range a bit and we will say that infection chance is also slightly higher. So we now have two objects of the class virus. And we printed out the information of the first one. Now let's print out the information of the second one. All right, so far so good. Now, as you remembered, we have the data, which is, for example, 0 0.2, and we have the actions. And I said that we want to bring everything together. And that's in object-oriented language, it's called encapsulation. So we want to have your properties or your attributes together with your methods. And now you can say, wait a minute, you just defined your properties right here, which is outside the clause, which is not really what we want. And I will show you why this is potentially dangerous and why it's not recommended to do it that way. So imagine, so as a non-native speaker, sometimes I'm confused and I would not write infection chance, but I would write infection change. Okay. And I would run this cell and everything is fine. So there's not an error, we just added an attribute here called infection change. But if we then try to call 
the function, we will get an attribute error saying virus object has no attribute infection chance. And that is because we didn't define the chance, we defined the change. So to take care of that, what we're going to do is we're going to um, initialize the properties within the clause itself. So, and to do so, we will create a method which is typical for most of the clauses you see up there. And it's going to be called initialize in it. And what we do actually by writing def double underscore in it, double underscore, um, is we're going to overwrite the default constructor. So every clause has by default the constructor, which is assigning values to the properties of your clause. And we're going to overwrite it with our given values. And as with any method in a class, always start with self. That's not any different for your constructor. So we'll write self and then we will insert as arguments uh, the property values. So we will insert the name, we will insert the infection range, and we will insert the infection chance. There you go. Now, to assign those values to the properties of the clause, what you should do is write self dot name. And we will assign the value of our input argument, which is name. And then we will do the same for the other three input arguments here. Okay, so we have infection range and infection chance. Now, as you notice, this, this might look a bit weird if you're not familiar to it, because we have the same names popping up. If you would prefer it, you can also do um, input name, because this is just pointing to the arguments of the method. But by convention, what you typically see in constructors is that you give the input arguments the same names as um, the, the names of the, of the properties of your clause. It's Pythonic. It's Pythonic, it's not so in Java? No, I mean, yeah, but I mean, it's very Pythonic to do this way as well. Yeah, so if you, if you want to feel Pythonic, well, that's the way you should do it, apparently. So, okay, so we adjusted our class, we, we run our cell. Now, you will see that if I try to run this code, so if I tried, it's going to break, and the reason why is that we overwrote the default constructor, so we don't have a virus with an empty constructor anymore. So we, we should feed in the values here now. So, um, okay, let me, let me comment out this part and let's create a virus one as virus one, that's the name. And then we have 0 0.2 as range and 0 0.01 as infection chance, okay. And then for virus two, we will do the same. 0 0.5. 0 0.02. Okay, so now we created two objects of our virus class, exactly the same as before, but we don't risk of using wrong names. So if you now call the functions, what you see is that everything is working fine again. So let's have a look at our slides now for a second. So. I created the class virus with the data and the methods associated to the data. So far, so good. But as you might have noticed, I also had mortality rate, which is making this coronavirus lethal. Um, and I didn't implement it. And there's a good reason for that, because you might know or you might not know, but there's also viruses which are not so harmful for us, which we actually need to survive. And um, we also want to create a structure in our programming language where we can define any kind of virus with some common properties and some properties which are specific to one kind of virus. And the coronavirus is obviously deadly. So we want to make a separate clause of it, which is having the same properties as the virus clause, but with some additional pieces of information. And to do that, we will inherit from our super clause virus and make a subclass called lethal virus. And the, the, the beauty here is that you can just make a new class and what you would do in sequential programming is you would have to redo everything, retype all your methods and um, your properties. 
and then add the only little bit which is changing. So the only thing which is changing here is that we will define a new function, document mortality, and recover or die, and that we will have this mortality rate property. But all the rest is similar to the superclass uh, properties and methods. So um, what we can do in Python is inherit from a superclass and make a subclass. So let's, let's try to do that in our notebook. So we will add a cell and say, okay, SARS-CoV-2 is clearly deadly, so I will comment it out over here. And we will make a new class. And to define a class which is inheriting from a superclass, just use the same terminology. And this one we will say it's called lethal virus. And lethal virus is inheriting from our other virus class. And to indicate this, we can just type virus with a capital, referring to this other class. Maybe as a side note, in previous releases of Python, um, in Python 2, any class would inherit from um, a Python structure called objects. So you might see um, main classes also written like this. So that's how you would write it in, in Python version 2. But for Python version 3, you don't have to do it. You only okay. write it. Oh, yeah. Other Go way ahead. around, I think. I think you want to have, uh, you want to inherit from object in, in virus. Sorry? No, you, you don't. You, you, you okay. don't have, you, yeah, in virus, yeah. In virus, you, you inherit from object, yeah. Yeah. In Python okay. 2. Yeah. And, and, so, and this is. Python specific, so don't, don't worry about it too much. Don't worry, don't worry about it too much. So we will make uh, the lethal virus. And um, let's see. So we will create, we will use the same constructor as we had with virus, so which is setting the values to our properties. And you might wonder why I'm not copying this, because there's ways to actually do it more elegant. Um, and Mark can tell you about it, but it's like it's already like high level. So that's not what we're going to cover today. The only thing we are going to do is to add a property called mortality rate. Okay. And we will add the mortality rate to the mortality rate property. Right. And then something else we will do is we will define a function to document mortality. It's similar to the document self, so I will just copy it from here. And it's called document mortality. Okay. And it will print out the mortality of the virus, so the mortality is, and then we will print out the mortality rate. Okay, so we made our subclass which is inheriting from virus. Now let's see how it looks like. So let's try to create an object from this um, subclass. So we will make virus2, SARS-CoV-2, and we need an ad additional input argument. We need a mortality rate, let's say uh, 1%. So 1% of the people who are infected will die from it. Um, So virus, we will make an object of the lethal virus class. All right, there we go. So we made our V2 little virus. And now let's see whether we can actually access this method, which I defined only in the subclass. So let's say V2 and document mortality. V2 document mortality. Let's see what it does. And it does print out mortality. And now something very neat is we can also say v2 dot document not a mortality but document self. And as you see, we didn't repeat document self as a method in the lethal virus clause. It's still in the in in uh, the separate clause. So let's see if it works. And yes, it does work. So. The same goes like still for virus one, where we didn't change anything. So we, we can still document the information of virus one. That is working. Oops. Okay. But virus one 
is not an object of this subclass, um, lethal virus. So we will not be able to document immortality because in virus one, we didn't define that as a property. Uh, so indeed, it will give you an attribute error. Okay. So um, I will share with you guys this uh, notebook on how to make a class and how to make properties. And we, we covered um, constructors, default constructors, and how to override it. And we also covered how you can inherit from a separate class and make a subclass with specific properties. So that's the example I wanted to cover with you guys. And now I will quickly show you how that apply um, to that program I told you about before. So we will make that available in our GitHub folder. And we're not going to implement anything right now. But I just wanted to show you that indeed, as we said, we have our run model.python script where we're actually executing the model. We have a virus with the properties we just defined. There is some additional Mark, do you see my screen or yeah, yeah, I can see it, but just uh, it's really small right now. That's all. Oh yeah. Good to know. I have a small laptop screen though, of course, but no, no, no. Good that you say so. All right. So cool, thank you. Um, we see the virus class with the properties as we defined it. You will see that there's other things going on. So there's documentation on what the properties are. You can read all of that. Um, we will assign values to our properties. This is our constructor. There's a method called infect to actually infect people. Then there's virus lethal, which is inheriting from the virus class, doing exactly what we said before with some additional methods. We have our society where we define whether or not we have lockdowns. We have a population where we define a population number and the location of the population. And then we have a simulation script, which is not a class, but which just gathers the um, functions we need to actually make the operations going on. And I leave this up to you guys, but you can run the model and you will see how for example, implementing a lockdown will influence this speak. So you might remember from our previous video that infection is growing exponentially and was then completely out of control. So and in this simulation, what I did was implementing a lockdown so that people don't move anymore, so that you won't exceed this health care capacity actually, and that people have time to recover in time before um, actually dying. So, and you can play with all the values listed in these scripts and you can try to change them and um, you can use it as a, as a tool maybe to, to think about what's going on out there in the world. Um, so that's the example I wanted to show. You see that people already start to recover. Infection rate is going down. At one point, you will release the lockdown. That's how it's implemented in the code. So people will start moving again. Um, until you need another lockdown, et cetera, et cetera, until um, the virus is, is spreading out. So people are starting to move again. You will see an increase in infection now. Lockdown will be in place and it will decrease again. So that's basically the example I wanted to share with you. So let's go back to our slides. Benjamin, that was epic. <laughs> I like how you took a, a problem, you know, and you know, use variables to describe it and then organize those variables and you know, model the problem as a series of classes. That was very cool. Thank you, Mark. You bet. <laughs> All right, so could you go to the next slide? Yes. All right, so that's it. So thanks everyone for watching our webinar. Um, as a reminder, you'll get a reminder email from Lynn when the webinar recording is up on our website. Uh, again, the repository where we have all the code and slides for all of our webinars is up on GitHub, github.com slash CSDMS slash level up. So this is the last in our series. You know, I think Benjamin and I may come back and do some more because it's been kind of fun. But if you have any feedback for us, you know, feel free to email us or if you'd like, uh, contact us through the CSDMS help desk. All right, so uh, right now, if you have any questions for us, uh, you can unmute your mics, you can ask us directly over the, you know, over the air, or if you'd like, you can use the chat window as well.
But other than that, hey, thanks. That was fun. Yeah, thanks for watching you all. Yeah. I see that there's a question coming in. The one little thing while we're waiting as well, Benjamin, it was kind of cool. It was very CSDMS of you to, you know, take someone else's open source code and remix it for your own purposes. That was very cool. Yeah, CSD all, yeah all, all kudos to Paul again for coming up with this great code. So that's actually like maybe a little piece of advice to, to grad students as well. If you, if you want to tackle a problem, always go on the internet first and see if other people already did it before you. So don't waste your time in reinventing the water, the hot water. All right. And again, we tried to keep things kind of high level. You know, Benjamin, you, we use Python, and that's kind of the language we use at CSDMS, you know, but Benjamin tried to keep things even simple in Python as well. So there's more advanced things we could do in Python and in object oriented programming, but we chose to try to keep things high level in this webinar. That's right. Oh, so there's a question about the dot self in the constructor. So the init file. So the init file is a constructor. And I don't know exactly what you mean, but if you mean that uh, why is self there as an input argument, well, any function or definition in Python takes self as the first input argument. That's by definition, that's the convention. There are other programming languages where in a constructor you would not need to feed in the self statement, but in Python you always have to. And I, I think that's actually pretty good. So that's quite clear. If you make a, a method in, in Python, always feed the self statement to it as a first yeah. argument. Right, so the self statement has to go as the first argument in the argument list. You also have to use self inside the constructor in order to make sure that Python knows that you're creating attributes for a class. So if you do self dot uh, like uh, infection rate, for example, if you just had uh, infection range, Python wouldn't know that that's actually an attribute of the virus class, even if it's inside the code. That's why you need the self uh, identifier before it. That's right. And that's, yeah, that, that's a little bit of Python, but that's also, as Benjamin mentioned, that's also something that is used pretty commonly in other object oriented programming languages. Yeah, don't forget that any method you define in a class is operating on an object of that class. So, and given that you can have many objects, you want to let Python know on which object you're actually doing the operation. So that's why you always have to introduce self in any method you're using in classes. Okay, Mark, I think that's it. I think that's it. Okay, well, thanks everyone. See you later. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching.